author means reader. Uh, I'm Mary Francoli. I'm one of the associate deans for the Faculty of Public Affairs. Uh, just to give everyone a, a bit of background, uh, this is an event where our faculty members have a chance to discuss a book that they recently published uh, with a group of panelists uh, and with our community. Uh, we meet a few times each semester. Uh, normally we would be meeting in person, um, but now we're doing it by Zoom like most things. Um, we will have quite a bit of time for some questions at the end, so if I could ask people to hold your questions for now. Um, I'm going to start by introducing today's author and then the two panelists, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lara, who I'll introduce shortly here. So we're joined by uh, the author of the book that we're going to be discussing today. Um, the author is Mira Sukrov. Mira Sukrov is a professor of political science and the university chair of teaching innovation here at Carleton University. She's the author uh, and editor of many different books and most recently, Borders and Belongings, a memoir, the book that we're here to talk about tonight. She's published many uh, op-eds and she's won a faculty commentary, public commentary award for that uh, work. She's also a five-time teaching award winner. She's the founding co-chair of the Jewish Politics Division at the Association of Jewish Studies. And she's a co-editor of the AGS Perspectives and currently sits on the New Israel Fund of Canada Advisory Council. And today, Lara is, or Mira is joined by Lara Levitt, who is Professor of Religion, Jewish Studies and Gender at Temple University, where she has chaired the Religion Department and directed both the Jewish Studies and Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies programs. She's also uh, co-edited multiple collections and authored several books, including her most recent, The Objects That Remain. She edits NYU Press's North American Religion series with Tracy Fesden and David Harrington Watt. And Lara and Mira are joined by Brian Cates. Brian is a film and television editor whose credits include The Laramie Project, The Woodsman. He's won Emmy Awards for both The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Taking Chance. This is really like cutting it short, I have to say. He's an executive producer of the upcoming documentary Israeli is Israelism, and he's currently working on season three of the HB series Succession. So Brian, I will try to refrain from asking you any questions about uh, season three of Succession <laughs> during this, as I know is- I'm not allowed to say. Topic. <laughs> uh, so with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Laura, uh, who's going to moderate um, the questions and we'll give you a bit more information about how things will work. Um, Thank you, Dean Francoli. This is lovely to be with all of you this evening. Um, I feel like I don't go anywhere. So I'm kind of with all of you in Canada, um, still in my little room where I seem to do my entire life these days. So it's a delight to be here. Um, and so when we were kind of organizing today's um, event, we thought it would be helpful to have someone kind of do some moderation. So um, I kind of took on the role. And so I will kind of keep track of kind of where we're going. And what I thought I would do is just kind of give you an idea of kind of the, the flow of um, the program so that you kind of know where we're at. And I will say, if you have a question that you'd like to put in the chat, please do so. Um, we're gonna try to get to them. And um, the other thing is we are a diverse crowd. And um, for some of you, some of the conversation will be more familiar and for others, it will be less familiar. So we would really delight in your asking questions. If there are terms that are used that you're not sure of, please just put them in the chat. We would love to address them um, as we go. So those are just some caveats. And so let me tell you a little bit about the format. I'm going to, in a brief moment, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mira, who will um, uh, both introduce her book, offer um, a, a brief um, reading from the text so you get a feel for this wonderful book. Um, and then what we're going to do is she's gonna talk a little bit also about how she chose the two of us, Brian and me, to be her um, interlocutors for tonight's um, 
a conversation. And then we will move from there into a first round of questions. Um, Brian will get us started, I will follow up. And then what we're hoping to do is move from those questions, those initial questions, into a couple of thematic discussions that kind of bring us all into conversation with each other. The first of those will be really about craft. And we're excited about this because Mira is a prolific writer and scholar, but um, in this book, she's really writing memoir in a really different mode um, than the kind of expositional work that she's done previously. And so we're excited for her to talk about the kind of work she does and to put that conversation in, in, um, in, in terms of process to the kind of work that Brian does with film and television and the kind of work that I do in its slightly different mode um, as a scholar of religion and Jewish studies. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we think about the past in an ever changing present. And this will also include issues around melancholia and, um, and, uh, and nostalgia. And so we want to do that. And then we're going to really open it up for general questions. And I'll try to be keeping track in terms of time because we would like to stay within the hour and a half because we know how zoomed out so many of you are. So it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm now going to turn this over to, to Mira. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Mary and Stephanie for organizing and to Brian and to the Faculty of Public Affairs for providing a forum to discuss my book with uh, two eminent thinkers and professionals. And I'll just explain why I brought uh, wanted to be in conversation with Laura and Brian. And let me just also explain, author meets readers. I think Mary, did Mary explain this? Where an author meets, chooses a scholar and someone from the community, any community, depending on the topic of the book. And so for me, when I was thinking about community, I was thinking about one of the people I am frequently in conversation with about pressing issues regarding Israel-Palestine. We have a lot um, a lot of common background and vantage point. And I find that Brian and I, well, and Laura, but Laura gets to be the scholar category. Brian and I have struggled with a lot of the same things and have sought out a lot of similar visions for new ways of thinking about Israel-Palestine. In addition to all that, those ways of thinking about Israel-Palestine, thinking about questions of attachment, uh, Hebrew attachment, both Brian and I have studied Arabic, Brian more recently than me. In other words, I studied it when I was getting um, undergraduate course credit for it. Brian is studying it without the need for credit. So Brian gets more credit for studying it for, for without credit. Um, Brian and his husband, Jonathan, will uh, go to Palestine, find themselves on occasion, uh, hanging out with a Israeli cousin of mine, completely coincidentally, who's involved in similar activist uh, engagement uh, in Ramallah. And so there, we have a lot of common contact, contact points. In addition, I'm fascinated and so much respect the work that Brian does in the realm of storytelling as a film and television editor, editor on some of my favorite shows and films. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about that in terms of craft, both the technical aspects in terms of how you make stories and also what drives Brian, what drives me and what drives Laura in terms of the purpose of our work and what really motivates us. So Laura was the, is, gets to be the scholar who I got to pick. And Laura is a scholar really like no other, partly because she's um, known um, second to none as a mentor. And she's a mentor to so many. And she came into, she in fact won a very significant mentoring award um, last year uh, before the pandemic when we could fet her together at a women's uh, Jewish studies breakfast at the, the large conference we both attend. And early, early on in this project, really what, before I had really engaged in this project, when I was between projects, Laura is someone I sought out and I paced around the room I'm in right now. Laura was pacing around an airport. We were talking on the phone and, and Laura was helping me shape my ideas. Um, there are only two scholars whose work I cite directly in this book because the great thing about memoir is a lot of the normal academic conventions are able to be put aside and one of those is needing to put in footnotes to show that you've tracked the literature. In this case, it's implicit that the ideas that I am um, putting forth are informed by the literature. But there were only two scholars who I felt the need to cite. And one of them is Laura. And her work appears in uh, the chapter where I find out that a classmate of ours um, in Winnipeg has been killed um, 
in a bus bombing one night when I am um, at Hebrew summer camp in 1989. Um, Laura is an expert on trauma and loss and um, has a wonderful new book out that inspired me as well, even though our books came out around the same time. Um, so I'm going to start with an excerpt and then I'm going to turn it over to Laura and Brian for questions and just one more sentence really before I get into the expert excerpt why I wrote this book is that I love memoir, I love stories and I wanted to see if I could take a lot of the struggles that I am observing in the Israel Palestine domain and the struggles that I experience as an Israel Palestine scholar and share those with my readers in the in the in the way of storytelling that is so um, succinctly and um, effectively done in creative nonfiction. And one of the many people who helped me along that journey is here tonight. And that was my wonderful editor, Holly Rosenswake, who's in Michigan. And I wanna give a shout out to her. And she helped me fine tune the manuscript at the very late stages, um, making sure that I really, she was my, uh, my final reader. In other words, if there was something I put forward and she was curious about it, well, tell me a little bit more about this. And how did you feel here? Not to mention all the great language and stylistic corrections that everyone always can use more of. So thank you to Polly. And here I go with the prologue, 2015. Sorry, Mira, the email says, I need to pull out of the group. My husband doesn't want you in our home. I swallow hard. The email is from a woman I know from the local Jewish community years ago. We had spent the afternoon together in her tidy suburban home, surrounded by dress up clothes and dollhouses as our daughters played noisily. A few weeks earlier, I had created a bar and bat mitzvah project group for Jewish youth around town. My daughter's bat mitzvah was coming up and I wanted to shore up the Ottawa cohort, create a sense of community, encourage families to see how this personal milestone could be mobilized to pursue a smattering of social justice. We, the parents, had spent a week over email coordinating the timing and locations and guest lists and program and menu. Rotating hosts would supply the space and the refreshments, and I promised to guide the kids in designing a social justice campaign on a topic of their choice. First, we'd learned how to identify wrongs that need writing. I figured I'd start with something simple, a fictional scenario about a jelly bean factory in crisis, maybe. I'd ask the kids to consider why the factory had suddenly run out of jelly beans. What might the causes and remedies be? We would talk about justice. We'd think about individuals and structures and systems, the workers' conditions, the children who needed the jelly beans, the price of sugar, the town's water supply. Once we identified causes and solutions, we'd consider how to leverage social media to help repair the world. We would learn about Maimonides' ethical ladder of charity. And I would try my best. I promised myself to keep my own politics out of it, mostly anyway. I'd encourage the kids to come up to their own conclusions. And at the end of the evening, we'd eat ice cream and drink hot cocoa. Hot chocolate for hot issues, I called it. I continue reading the woman's email. My husband says you support a group calling for the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. My mind spins. Which group is her husband thinking of? It can't be the local Jewish community boards I've sat on. Those are each squarely mainstream, although I've admittedly tried to push their boundaries. Maybe it's the American Jewish organization I'm on the board of and for which I fundraise and travel to New York once a year for meetings. For that group, I've been working to get a progressive slate elected to the World Zionist Organization. The group is certainly liberal, but it's definitely Zionist, so it can't be that one. And would he even know about it? Or maybe it's the academic group I'm part of, the one that tries to oppose the occupation and oppose attempts at boycotting Israeli academia. That one is also liberal, but also within the Zionist consensus, and it's against BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel after all. So with my cheeks burning, I ask her, which group would that be? I wait for half an hour, irritated and restless, before a reply arrives in my inbox. The Palestinian people in general. And then she links to an article, an op-ed I had recently published. My editor at the Globe and Mail had titled it, The Problem with Picking Sides in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. In that piece, I was trying to lay out what I saw as a balanced approach for my Canadian readers. A few years later, it's true, I would come to question even that sort of approach. I would come to advance a more justice-forward, elbows-out position, clearly not in the direction her husband would want, but my stance is measured in this Globe and Mail piece she has sent me. Measured is clearly not good enough for them. As an Israel supporter, she writes, there is only one side. 
I close my email program and with my teeth clenched, I open a Facebook window. Wow, a new personal low for internal Jewish communal relations, I write. As I describe what happened with the incident scrubbed of names, reactions start to roll in. You'd be invited into my house and asked to stay for dinner. Don't be afraid to keep talking. Eventually they will hear you. I am deeply ashamed of my Jewish community. Time for this woman to stand up for herself. I'm grateful for the solidarity and I click like. A few minutes later, a friendly acquaintance calls about some other matter. I fill her in on what I've been going through today, but I don't get the reaction I'm hoping for. If you're going to put yourself out there, you're going to get burned, she says. And for the rest of the day, all I have is my righteous indignation and a splitting headache. How did I come to be perceived by those who seemingly liked me enough to chat every day at pickup time outside of the JCC preschool and to smile across the room at baby music and to invite me to their home for playdates as an enemy of the Jews? And some years later, how did I come to not often even know what I believed? How did my political and ethical rudder, once so firm and certain, start to warp from the waters of communal pressures coming at me from all directions? When it comes to the topic of Israel, a subject on which I was suckled and weaned during seven years of Jewish day school, a decade at Hebrew summer camp, and three years of living in the country, soaking up the atmosphere, and sometimes dreaming about moving there myself, when it comes to Israel, a subject on which I've claimed to be a scholar specialist for all of my adult life, and about which I have never hesitated in speaking up and speaking out, I guess I should have known that anything is possible. Uh, you're muted, Laura. Thank you, Mira. Um, I think this gives everyone a little bit of a taste of the interplay between the personal and the political, which is so much a part of this memoir. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Brian to get us started um, with some questions, but uh, I just had to kind of really highlight that piece of the, the text because it is just so um, palpable the sort of embodied ways in which we carry these legacies forward. And Mira does this so powerfully and so um, compellingly over and over again as the chapters unfold. Thank you, Laura. Mira, it's, it's a wonderful book. And uh, I read it again over the weekend. And I, there were so many touchstones of things in my own life and the lives of the lives of my friends that, that I was reminded of um, in terms of Zionist upbringing, summer camp, um, but also living in the diaspora and feeling this need to be a part of something through indoctrination actually, but also um, a kind of genuine love that is fostered from an early age and I personally can't quite let go of. And I feel like that's a very strong theme in your book as well. Um, what's interesting to me in the book and I wanna ask you about is that um, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of trauma highlighted in the book, but, but almost all of the personal trauma happens in Canada and is regarding um, domestic matters and romantic matters and family matters like divorce, medical issues, there's a skin cancer um, scare, there's, um, there's issues around friendship and around affiliation and, but, it's, but it's, it's all within the Canadian realm. And yet the, 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 the narrative driver in the book really is Palestinian trauma which is not something that you experience personally, but, um, but are forced to reckon with through an engagement with good history and news and journalism and with people teaching you, with mentors who you, who you meet along the way. And so I find it fascinating that this is like this bifurcated book where so much of the trauma is domestic and Canadian, but there's the elephant in the room, which is the Nakba and Palestine. And that's never experienced personally. And yet it's the thing that's, really changing you through history. And um, I'd love to know if that's, I mean, that's how I experienced the book. Is that how you, was that intentional when you wrote it? Did you want, did you feel like that was motivating you and also in your life since it's true, it's a memoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that observation. What, what I try to show, particularly in chapter three, as you'll recall in the Fallujah chapter, is that I was for most of my life operating within a fairly narrow frame. It wasn't that Palestinian trauma was invisible to me, but uh, it, I own my um, touchstone um, uh, points for engagement 
sort of ex only extended so far. And then at a certain point, so in that chapter, um, when I'm spending a lot of time at my beloved kibbutz in the, the Negev region, the desert, the Southern region of Israel, and I noticed that every day the um, field workers, the, 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 the guys on the kibbutz and some women take the, their cars out to their uh, daily work branch. And it happens to be at some fields some distance away from the kibbutz, whereas a lot of the other work branches are right, right there at the, in, the, in the cow shed and the um, um, orchards. And they call those fields Fallujah. And I know enough of Hebrew and Arabic to know that it's not a Hebrew word, but I don't ask why they call it Fallujah. Almost everywhere else in Israel has, if it had uh, where there was Palestinian presence um, and there is no more, has been renamed, has been Hebraicized, yet this area remains Arabic. And so much, much later, actually literally sitting in the JCC, where I talk about the preschool years of my, my our kids being at preschool and then some of the ruptures with some parents, namely that one parent that I wrote about the prologue, I'm, I'm waiting for my kid at preschool while I'm upstairs in the cafe doing my homework. I guess that's what we call it when we're profs. And I decide to research a bit more about Fallujah. This is many years before I wrote the memoir. And so there is the, the point there by which things can be, you're, we're aware, but we're not always fully aware until we make the decision to become more aware. And a great a parallel, I think that's going on right now for my generation and those older than me is in Canada. We were always aware of the indigenous presence, but we're, we weren't fully aware in the way that we're becoming more aware. And I and I expect and hope that 20 years later, that awareness will be much more uh, fully realized. It's fascinating. But did you did you feel like as you, I mean, anxiety is also a, a, a big theme in your book, and and there are even panic attacks that you that you document later in life, and there, it's never really spelled out whether those have anything to do with the political situation. And yet every other chapter is about the, the political situation. So in my mind, I was drawing an, an invisible connection that wasn't spelled out. And to me, that's one of the fascinating things about the book is that um, it has these two registers in these two locations and you don't always com com uh, tell us what the connection is, but I think the audience imagines it and that, or the reader imagines it. And to me, that was, it was fascinating because I, I filled in some of the blanks with my own associations of those of those conflicts. Some of the points of anxiety, um, as I portray in the book, really result quite directly from my parents' divorce when I was a young child and the family, uh, some degree of family chaos. It could have been worse, I, I would say. Like it's, it wasn't the most horror story divorce that there is, but you know, divorce was not easy on me as a young child. And I, I bring the reader into that. And so some of the anxiety comes from that. And then what ends up happening for me, and then later on more flare-ups of anxiety in my early teen years. And what I find, what I discover is that Jewish camp, Jewish summer camp, Hebrew immersion summer camp becomes my refuge. And there all my anxiety uh, completely disappears. And so that becomes sort of a liminal space between uh, real life anxiety, the, the anxiety trigger, triggered by real life and real um, dynamics and emotions and family rupture. And then um, later on when I go to Israel and then I'm confronting more directly my political uh, experience and my political affiliations and commitments and that Jewish summer camp is that middle space. So I guess the question is, we're sort of always say, searching for safe spaces to, to broaden mm -hmm. term beyond its uh, regular usage. And then what was going on? So then the question is, what, what was going on for me in that safe space? What was going on for me in that seemingly neutral space? It wasn't neutral at all. It was very okay. identity forming and very uh, powerful in terms of political um, messaging. But it's fascinating because you're, you're a good student and that, and that makes you fascinated by Jewish history and by modern Hebrew and by learning about Israeli culture. But that same, like being a good student is what forces you to go deeper into the history and learn the history of Palestine and to learn other points of view. And that's eventually what create what is an anxiety provoking situation because you become in conflict with your community. You, 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 you become such a good student that you grow, you grow out of your community in a sense, or some parts, parts of your community. And then I reach conflict with yet um, more narrower and narrower slices of my community. So later in later right. chapters, as, um, as you know, I, 
I, and actually this is how we met, Brian. Remember, you you messaged me to use a very 20, um, 2021 term back in 2017. You messaged me during the crisis that I talk about in, in within my community, but to the left. And that crisis, and actually my dad was visiting and, and he's mentioned in the book and he we told him not to get involved in the Facebook debate to try to help me and he got shredded in the debate. And, um, and that was a debate that was happening uh, when I was not no longer critiquing to my right, but now I was facing my op-ed pen to a, an incident that happened to the left, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, a campaign that I, I didn't agree with. And you reached out to me in solidarity saying, wow, I see you're really trying to engage in good faith and these kinds of debates and what's going on with you is really painful. What, what you're facing is really painful. So we, we bonded on that. And so it wasn't so much that you were saying, um, you weren't you weren't taking a stand on the political debate. You were uh, observing the emotional dynamics of it all, and that to me is really right. what went on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, I think <laughs> I'm going to just pipe in here for a moment because I think that one of the things that Brian is also pushing you on, and it's something that I recognized as I was rereading the book, is that you often you know you write about symptoms, and you know symptoms are. Um, embodiments of something that's un, un, in the, that's out of place, right? And that's out, out of whack. And I think that there is a way in which um, the connection that Brian is really asking you to think about between these different traumas and the sort of anxieties around them. And of course, they're all coupled together because in the ways in which you've so beautifully described this, um, you were looking for home. And so you were looking for this, you know, a safe place, a place where you wouldn't feel so, um, uh, maybe vulnerable and vulnerability can be a strength. And I think that is actually a strength of your book is that you are fiercely vulnerable in this book and it's not out of weakness, but out of strength. But I think at the same time that those um, symptoms, the symptoms of the anxiety, the, you know, the, the, the various embodiments of the discomfort um, are bound together. And I think the interplay between the sort of geopolitical and the personal, that, that movement back and forth, because you are so invested, right? Um, because you took on Israel through camp, through Hebrew, through your study in such a way that it was, you know, deeply in a part of you and embodied in you. And so I do think that, that there is more to the symptomology, which is not simply a repetition of the, the family trauma, but the sort of ongoingness because these things are interrelated in the story you tell. Mm -hmm. And I really like your point about vulnerability, which is a, a key um, mode that I really try to engage in this book. And actually um, one of my proudest moments as a teacher, as a prof was when I got a teaching evaluation back a comment in one of my teaching evaluations from one of my first year seminars many years ago. And my student wrote, she, you know, wonderful prof. So I knew it was meant as a compliment because there was a context there. Wonderful prof. She is so vulnerable. She shows us her vulnerability. And I was just, I just, you know, clutched that teaching eval to my heart. And I remember showing it to another prof, can't even remember who now. And I said, what do you think of this? And they said, I hope I never get anything like that, right? So people have different <laughs> sort of modes and desires and ways of wanting to be um, in front of the classroom. But I think the key point is, and I think this gets to what you, what you were saying and really what I feel in the book, it's agentic vulnerability. That sounds so jargony. Being an agency, an agent of your own vulnerability versus um, having vulnerability thrust on you. So, um, I don't know if you, I mean, cause this is, I mean, this is, I'm really getting into your bread and butter here. Um, in yeah, terms but I think that what maybe you, part of the yeah. distinction is that vulnerability can be a strength. It's an openness. Mm -hmm. It's an openness to complexity. It's an openness to, um, to hearing others, um, to being present. Mm -hmm. um, and that's different than being, um, th than being fearful, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, having fear is not the same as being vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I think that um, this is a, a strength of yours. And it's part of how you bring students into um, the, this, this subject matter that you care so much about. Mm -hmm. And you want them to understand that people care about this material deeply and profoundly. And mm -hmm. so you model that in the writing and I suspect in your classroom as well. Mm -hmm. And have been since a young age, 
clearly in the book because I mean there's like a there's a kerfuffle with a black uh, an intended blackface performance at camp that Mira tries to dis disrupt and I mean it, it it seems like you're the only person at the entire camp who sees that this is a potential problem which is I mean it's believable but it's it's upsetting but y you're fearless and you're you're like a, it's like once you figure out what the truth is you don't mind the consequences but they burrow themselves inside you for later possibly and come out in unexpected ways. And I feel like maybe we see those ways in, in subsequent chapters and it's not necessarily tied to the event narratively, but as, an, as a reader, we, we experience them that way. Thank you for that observation. Yeah, actually the melanoma diagnosis came hmm, three weeks after I called out the blackface um, production and tried to get it stopped. So there you go. Hmm. Yeah, so fear okay, piled up on fearlessness. And so some things come from outside and some things come from outside and we, we react to them. Um, I'm not yet one of those kinds of person, people that says, oh, you can choose, you can't choose what happens to you, but you can choose how you react to it. I'm not yet there. Like that'll be like my next self-help book, like in 20 years, I'm not there yet. Um, well, I think this is great. I think I want to just ask you one other kind of question before we kind of shift our gears and talk some more about the thematics, because I'm seeing we have a lot of questions in the uh, in the chat, so I want us to be able to have time for them. So the other question that I have for you, Mira, is that, I, you know, I think that one of the things that this book does, and this is something that you and I've discussed before, is that in a way, your, um, your experience in some ways marks um, Kind of a, a kind of a high point, and maybe kind of a, a, an end of a certain kind of era of um, a kind of self evidency of a certain way of being a North American Jew who has a connection to Israel and has a kind of you know liberal left politics, and that all of these things just made sense together in a particular way, that it was, you know, this kind of affirming place. This is part of what camp was about. Um, and I guess I want you to talk a little bit about kind of what's shifted um, from that time in which you were going to Hebrew camp. Um, and also kind of um, as, a, as a mother, because you began with your children um, and the kind of Jewish world in which you are, you know, kind of shaping with them and for them. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of Hebrew and how that might be connected and also different maybe for them than it was for you um, in, in thinking about these questions? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right in that there is always a little bit of an end of an era to an extent after, you know, the, the, a certain door closed behind me after I aged out of um, undergrad. And that was partly was what was going on in Israel, Palestine. So it, Oslo was the high point of, I would say, of optimism, but not everyone was optimistic, as I note in my book that Edward Said wasn't optimistic and many Palestinians felt that Oslo was a sellout, but among liberal Jews, it was a high point of optimism to think that there was new, there were new possibilities that were more just and more peaceful than what had been. And that was 1993. And that was right in the beginning of my fourth and final year of undergrad. And I had just returned from the first of the three years in which I lived in Israel. So we got, and I, I document this in the book that friends of mine and I gathered in the one apartment where the one friend of ours who owned a TV, um, it wasn't, I talk about, it wasn't cool to own a TV uh, back in the early nineties at McGill for in my social circle that was sort of considered too bourgeois. We only went to the rep, repertory theaters. But you know what? The one person who owned a TV, he was nominated for an Oscar a couple years ago. So there you go. He got the last laugh. So Brian likes that because Brian. <laughs> I'm laughing because my parents bought me a TV when I got to NYU Film School, and I was so angry because it was so uncool to have a TV, <laughs> oh, totally. and I gave it back. <laughs> so yeah, Andrew I related Rosen. to that detail too. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Andrew Rosen, who's a film producer, and he was nominated for an Oscar, and and um, that was great. So high point, and but then we realized, well, the Palestinian and Arab students who we were in dialogue with. And so this is the point of this high point of liberal of progressive Zionism. We thought we were, we thought we had all the answers. We were the Jews who were reaching out to the Arab and Muslim students and having dialogue groups. We were the ones who were, who were, who were totally evolved, holistic Zionist Jews. 
And yet what happened when Oslo was signed as I document in the book, and this is excerpted in Tablet Magazine, if anyone wants to read the excerpt from the, the book, the, the memoir, the, the students, the Palestinian Arab and Muslim students um, closed off dialogue and they said, we can no longer continue our dialogue group with your progressive Zionist group because now that also has been signed, it would, in their view, be tantamount to endorsing an agreement they didn't believe in. So this was sort of our first political um, cold shower awareness that this was, you know, cold water being splashed on our on our uh, liberal Zionist, progressive Zionist party. And, you know, since then, progressive Zionists have been squeezed more and more from both sides. And again, what I do try to make clear, especially in my teaching and public engagement, is that just because you're criticized from both sides doesn't mean you're right. The center is not necessarily the golden mean um, in politics. It may be important aesthetically at different times, but politics is not aesthetics. And so I'm always still trying to question um, my positions and sometimes they shift. And so now, and I don't try to give too many labels to my positions in the book because I don't want the book to be read as a political treatise. But those who followed my work have seen that I've shifted somewhat away from um, uh, progressive Zionism more into a more critical vein that questions some of those assumptions. Let's just put it that way. Um, and can you just can you just tell us a little bit more about the Hebrew? Because I think the Hebrew piece is also distinct in your story. And I think for folks who may be less um, um, uh, clued into some of this 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 material and some of these stories, um, you know, most North American Jew, I shouldn't maybe say that, but many North American Jews, lots of North American Jews don't speak Hebrew. They might be able to read Hebrew letters so that they can do this in a synagogue setting. But Mira, you really are talking about a kind of commitment to, um, to a language and a culture, um, which certainly I grew up in the United States. I'm a bit older than you um, in a small town and I, had that bad Hebrew and it took me a really long time to learn um, the Hebrew that I have, which isn't the most wonderful Hebrew. Um, but you have this rich Hebrew legacy that is a, both a part of your relationship to your father, um, to your grandmother, to your children, um, which in, increasingly sounds to me like it's not completely bound to the state of Israel. And if you could sort of talk about that, I think that would be really great. Mm -hmm. So I went to the only uh, remaining Hebrew immersion camp in North America. Uh, the camp is not named on purpose in the book so that it gave me more flexibility, more latitude to either be sometimes critical of some things that went on there and other times, and I would say the majority of times to be very effusive because it was overwhelmingly a positive experience and I didn't want it to read like an advertorial. Um, and so I just leave the name out, but it's well known uh, what it's easily to find out what camp it was. It's in uh, Hebrew camp in Manitoba. And Laura, you're actually, you're exactly right that I'm uh, rare among North American Jews in my level of Hebrew knowledge, but in Winnipeg, a vibrant Jewish community at the time that had 20,000 Jews at the time out of 600,000 total people in the city. So a large footprint of Jews and a very prominent cultural uh, footprint the Jewish community made, uh, it was normal to have fluent Hebrew. The, the, there were three Jewish day schools, ev almost everyone um, I can think of, like hundreds of kids um, attended Jewish day school where half the day was immersive Hebrew, or actually there was one Jewish day school where half the day was immersive Yiddish. So how's that for uh, arcane and, and interesting? And wow. our camp was Hebrew immersion. We spoke Hebrew all the time. I mean, it wasn't so good Hebrew. It was simple Hebrew, but it, it gave us the feeling for the language such that we could uh, be fluid in a simple way. Right? And, um, and I made the decision when my kids were born to speak only Hebrew to them, and I still do, they're now 16 and 14. And part of my motivation was that I wanted them to be able to get good parts in the plays if they went to Hebrew camp. And um, so there was a bit of a selfish motivation. And uh, I wanted them to feel a little bit like they have something um, that not everyone has, I guess. So it was a little, and, and I, you know, feel a little bit like it does connect us to Israel and Israelis and I want them and I want myself to be able to feel engaged because if I want to make change over their um, engagement and cult sensitive cultural engagement is the first most important way in 
And I think it's really important to be able to know. I mean, I would, I would, I wish my Arabic was stronger. I wish, I mean, I did take two years of Arabic in university. A um, problem with learning Arabic is it's bifurcated between written and writing and spoken. So it's hard to find a course that does both. So therefore my spoken Arabic is not good. Um, I could used to be able to read newspapers and translate things about foreign ministers and peace summits, um, but that didn't get me very far with everyday conversations. But um, to have a cultural sensitivity um, to a place enables one to enter into the um, mindset of a place and a people and really make advances. Great. I think this is just really important for people to know. And I do love that you want that the that the that the motivation and your initial motivation was performative because you love performing at camp and you wanted your kids to be able to have a leg up on performing in Hebrew at camp. Um, and then later you talk about the political part of it too and the cultural part of it, but I think that's really important. And there is just something about this camp experience. Those of you who may have read the novel, um, the Yiddish Policemen's um, Union, uh, which imagines a, a counter a historical um, vision of there isn't a state of Israel, but instead Jews go to this place in the north, sort of Canada slash mm, uh, Alaska. Um, and somehow, see, and when I read those chapters, and I said this to you and to Brian, when I read those, those chapters about camp, you know, that, that here you were speaking Hebrew, you know, um, in Canada, you know, and I just, it just was so, it, 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 it charmed me in some profound way that like, that again, that in some ways these cultural pieces are also mobile and that they, they can be incredibly fruitful in different contexts. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. And I, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like us to kind of shift gears a little bit um, and um, I'm going to ask Mira to take a peek in the in the chat and just see if you if there's any. Sure. Should I um, answer a few questions in the chat and then move to theme and craft? Yes, I think that or would craft. be great because we've got some going awesome. on and I think that would be terrific. Awesome. Um, okay, Yavuz is was one of my uh, was a summer student who worked on a course with me that I'm teaching right now, Netflix and politics. So trying to help students um, find politics under every stone. And today we did stand up comedy. It was it was powerful technique this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, for a first time reader of my book, are there any particular suggestions? What lenses should we analyze the information you provide? What questions should we ask ourselves when reading your book? Thank you so much. Well, Yavuz, the great thing about memoir is I've done all that work for you. And so all I ask is that you get comfortable, maybe make a cup of tea and just let yourself enter the story. And really what memoir does, that's so wonderful. Um, and that's why I love reading memoir. I, mean, I can't read enough of them. I can't get enough good memoir. So if anyone has more suggestions of new ones that have come out that I may have missed, um, the great thing, I talked about this last night at, at the Vancouver Jewish Book Festival, those of some of you may have been there too last night, and my dad, my father, Max Sukarov, who's here tonight, he was in conversation with me. One thing I said to him that I would also say to you, Yavuz, is the great thing about memoir is um, the author is very present and at the same time has gotten out of the way. In other words, the reader is inside um, my head and looking out at the world with my eyes rather than looking at me showing them the world. Of course, what I'm really doing is showing them the world, but I'm trying to um, simulate the idea of being inside myself. And that's really what creative nonfiction does. So please do, I look forward to, to spearing your reactions when you read the book. Um, but if you do want some things to think about for themes, belonging, search for home, um, diaspora Jewish engagement with Israel, uh, in Israel-Palestine, um, emotional life, and the making of an Israel-Palestine scholar. Those would be the key words if you were doing a, a library search. Uh, Max Sukarov, that's my dad to everyone. Um, so when Brian was asking about invisible connection between Canadian personal trauma and the theme of my book, can I read the very end of the panic chapter on page 145? Sure, um, thank you for suggesting that. Just the last... Um, paragraph on the okay so when Laura was talking about the difference distinction between vulnerability and fear um, the panic chapter is a very um, tight little nugget of fear 
and it really brings the reader into fear. And then you can see the difference between fear and vulnerability as you go through the book by contrasting the different modes, the different emotional valences that are in that chapter versus the others. And I think that's useful. Um, panic. It is a wizard of threat. It is a sort. Okay, so so several years ago, I got diagnosed with a shellfish allergy and I took it in stride and I made all the kosher jokes because those of you who aren't familiar with the Jewish dietary laws, it's not kosher to eat shellfish anyway. So it's like, oh, kashrut is now my friend. Ha ha ha. But as the months progressed and I started to realize sort of the gravity of this allergy and that I, my life was in danger, I got very panicky and I started to get panic attacks around eating and then as my dad explained, who is a psychotherapist, psychiatrist, once panic attacks start, they just start happening all sorts of times, even if you're not eating. And so this chapter is about coming to terms with the shellfish allergy and starting to cope with panic attacks. Okay, panic, it is a wizard of threat. It is a sorcerer of terror and discomfort using the same tools, sparkly stimulation and sensory showering that could bask a person in pleasure and delight if it only wanted to. Panic, it's like being a child of divorce all over again as I try to pull the pieces together. Safety and danger, reality and fear, swinging between houses with different carpets, between marriages and separations, between my real home and my dad's home and the home away from home that is summer camp, between the reality of the present and my nostalgia for the past, between Israel as a lived reality and my image of the place, between political poles between parts of my community and between my community and that of others, as I try to locate a single coherent, authentic narrative that is safe and secure and true. And then my dad adds later um, a tough question, Have, has the book given me a single coherent, authentic narrative that is safe and secure and true? So I would like to chew on that um, question and come back to it at the end, because that's a good question and a tough question. So thank you, Dad, for that. Um, and then Peter, I think we've talked a bit about the difference, Peter Larson, between being vulnerable and being afraid. And for me, the difference is agent is feeling agency and vulnerability as a mode of engagement and openness, uh, mindfulness to use one of the nouveau terms. And fear is none of those things. Fear is monkey mind and fear is feeling like one has no agency. And I mean, Laura has written a very, very powerful book right now on trauma and post-trauma coping. And I wonder if Laura has any more thoughts on that. Well, I, I just wanted to say that that passage that you read from Panic was beautiful because in some ways it brings together the question that, that Brian first asked you um, in that very passage. In some ways, you've always been shuttling between these places, longing for home, but never kind of finding it, right? It's it, You're always looking for the ideal one and it keeps eluding you. And it's both the it's the, the parents' houses, it's camp, and when you're not at camp, it's Israel and it's Canada. In that passage, they're all there, right? And we see again, the sort of intertwining of the sort of tensions that bring together the traumas, the early traumas, and then the later ones, because the disappointment of the home that breaks, right? That, 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 that can't sustain, that you can't live at camp and you, and, and, and in some ways you can't live in Israel, right? This becomes like a, 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 a site where um, th that kind of tension is being played out over and over. And I think that that passage does a beautiful job of kind of knitting together some of the dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of trauma, I just think that, you know, um, it, they, traumas don't go away. They, they're, they're, ever, they're absorbed in an ever shifting present, right? And so, you know, sometimes, again, we can have very different kind of reactions to them. So some of them can be more symptomatic um, and, and, and problematic because they can be dangerous and, um, and, and uncomfortable and frightening. Um, and in others, they can be um, some of what we learn that makes it possible to imagine a different future. And I think that one of the things that I love about what you've done is that in, in describing your own um, experiences of, of panic and, um, and fear, but also vulnerability, that you are able to think about other people, right? And other people's suffering. And, um, and, and the, it, it opens up a space of, of empathy, right? Um, and this is something that I know really motivates 
Brian's work. And so I think maybe what we could do now is kind of shift into this discussion about craft. And so maybe Brian could get us started, then I'll go to Mira and then I can kind of chime in. But um, I'm just thinking about what motivates your work. And, and this is kind of a perfect point from our discussions earlier, Brian. Sure. Yeah, I like the empathy segue. Uh, we Well, we had had a pre-discussion and we were talking about documentary versus narrative versus fiction and talking about historical historical fiction versus current uh, present day film. And, and, and to me, I mean, all, all film is essentially the, the same storytelling is storytelling. Um, in, in terms of what I'm looking for, in terms of editing though, it's, it's really an engagement with, with characters and that's really empathy. So if I try to boil it down to what am I, what in my craft, what I'm looking for, it's really, I mean, I look at tons of footage during the day and a lot of it's very, very similar to the footage that came before it, but there'll be a spark of, hopefully a spark of something in a character's eyes that will say, this is, this is engaging me with their emotional life. And um, I mean, I don't know how many of you know intimately what, the, what film editing entails, but you, know, you build scenes up for many, many different shots, many angles, many um, shot sizes, and many different nuances of performance, sometimes following the script, sometimes not following the script. And in documentaries, it's a lot more, it's a lot vaster and more fluid. Um, but I, but often you don't build a scene from the beginning of the scene in the script to the end. You find a piece of footage that, um, that 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 grips you because of that empathy. Because you 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 feel like this character is speaking to you in a very powerful way, and sometimes it means starting starting knowing that you have to build towards something in the middle of a scene, and then finding ways to. To, to, to segue from that to the end of the scene and build up from it from the beginning of the scene. It's all about what, what, what's the most um, driving emotional moment when you look at that footage, the footage the first time and try to, trying to organize it into hierarchy saying, well, this, is, this has this kind of engagement, but this has this kind of sh shot designer size. And you know, it's really about the puzzle of, of, of making a, a hierarchy of those, of those feelings and uh, and then trying to put it together. But really empathy is what it boils down to. And um, that's what makes it like many other art forms. And yet it's different in the sense that it's so, um, the, the mosaic aspect of it is, 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 is probably a little bit different. Mira, I think that's a really good place for you to talk a little bit about, again, I'm, I'm thinking about Brian talking about the interplay of your narrative that you move back and forth from the intimate to the political. And it does right. lend itself to a kind of cutting. Mm -hmm. So two ways that I do that. One is in how I ordered the chapters. And so what I did was because the chapters are sometimes quite distinct and they, and, and because I cover so much of my life, like from when I was three and a half till when I was 45 and a half, um, I, um, wanted to make it keep it interesting for the reader and keep it meaningful and keep the narrative front and center and narratives are often not chronological and nor are they always chronological in film how is there i wonder if there's a rough estimate if we knew the data on how many films run chronologically versus not but we could think about that and so i do or tv shows so i do oh i'm watching this is us right now ah there is a great example this is us. It, there's your emo, one is emotional manipulation show for the week. And it, it's very deliberate in its flashbacks and present. But I wanted to um, take the reader, alternate them between um, adulthood and childhood until the, two, the points converge. So that's how I ordered the chapters. And within the chapters, I do a lot of layering. Um, I don't do as much of that. Well, I don't. Okay. So when I'm a young child, I don't do any layering because there's not much behind me. But as I'm older, I start layering backwards and sometimes even forwards. And then I'll literally switch to the future tense. And I got, actually got that technique from the last page of Cheryl Strayed's Wild, where she goes into the future tense. Mm -hmm. And as my writing, I have a couple of wonderful writing mentors. One of them is Shulam Dean, one of them is Allison Pick. And Shulam Dean recommended Wild to me and noted that it is one of the most underappreciated memoirs. And I think he was right, because it's a very strong, it's a very strong book, despite the Hollywood, um, um, what's the word, uh, fame that it got. 
or in addition to the Hollywood fame that it got. So I try to layer them. And then dad, you asked me a question about this last night and here's the answer I wish I'd given because I had a day to think about it, about that layering. And so the layering is about um, bringing, uh, being in the current moment and anchoring the scene in the current moment for the reader, but then um, bringing up a, a memory from the past to the present. The present isn't necessarily 2021, right? The present is whenever I'm writing, I'm like, the present might be a scene in 1993, that's the present. But I wanna remind, I'm thinking in 1993 as a 21-year-old about something that happened when I was 14. So the point is, it's not, my dad, dad, you asked me last night, did I, was I remembering that as I was writing that chapter? So the point is, I don't know, I don't remember, but the point is you don't write, you don't actually write stream of consciousness. You just get the reader to think that's what you were doing, right? So it's all very deliberate so that the reader is feeling like you are now remembering that, but you're, you're doing it on purpose because if you just wrote um, stream of consciousness and all, everything was put together the way you actually thought about it at the time, you would get the reaction that I got when my writing mentor read my first draft. And I won't uh, give you that reaction now, quote it, because um, author meets reader at Faculty of Public Affairs never has swear words in it. I love that you just did that because I think that one of the things about, um, about Oh, writing and um, you know is is, is really craft and you know it, it, that it that you have to write and rewrite and rewrite and um, it seems effortless especially when a book is kind of you know small and concise and has these lovely little chapters and you just think oh isn't that just great but usually the shorter books are the ones that are um, more crafted and take longer to write than just writing a big fat book. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about that with you, um, because I know that for me, in a somewhat different way, um, I, and I wasn't trying to write memoir in the same way that you are uh, obviously using the genre here uh, quite effectively, but um, I, I also found that there were ways in which I think kind of, um, uh, in, I, I have a kind of associative way of thinking about the world, and so I make connections that are kind of odd, and so um, I, I had to figure out a way to bring the reader in. So I talk a lot about process and I kind of make the book a kind of companionship where I, I try to, in, my, in the objects that remain, the book that I just wrote, um, that I just published, I, I kind of bring, I bring readers into the process of writing and some of my, my efforts to do that. But one of the things that, um, that, that I had to really struggle with is I, I remember there was one chapter and my editor said to me, you need to change the order of this. And of course the order was the, the way that I idiosyncratically put things together and it made perfect sense to me. And he just said, no, a reader is not going to understand this. So I had to change the order around. And in the process of doing that, you know, then things that don't make any sense because they were, they, they came later in or earlier in the earlier rendition. Um, this is like the cutting and pasting work that I think Brian is talking about, where it's like, Completely. oh, and then you need somebody else to look at it because you just mush them all together in your head. So you need someone else to be able to say, oh no, they're not in the right order. Like, I, why are you talking about this here? And I had to literally give it to a friend and say, will you just read this chapter and tell me why this doesn't work? Mm -hmm. But you know, when film is great, you can make association, you can cut between things that don't make narrative, that are not narratively coherent. But if the craft, if something about the shot design or the, col or the color palette or the shot size or the camera movement or the music, is 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 emotionally coherent then the the incoherence of the story will suture itself and you'll go with it and that's the magic of film editing is that you i mean I, that's my favorite kind of filmmaking impressionistic but where the craft is pulling you through you don't even know necessarily where and and it's good because you don't really want to know where the story is going because you want to be surprised so if you can make associations that are that are outside of the box but pull the audience forward with the other elements of cinema, then I think that's the best, you know, that's the greatest um, way to build film. If you can't, it's hard. <laughs> and, I, and coherence I, can be great. And I think that does also happen in writing. Um, it, 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 we don't have the, we don't have all of the, the, the different dimensions. So we don't have the sound and we don't have the color and we don't have those elements, but we have, you know, ways of structuring narrative that can, that can do some of that work. But, um, but it is a kind of, um, 
a labored activity. And I think that mm -hmm. that's part of what we wanted to talk about at Craft. And I guess I want to just come back to Mira to just talk a little bit about the difference between um, the writing that you've done so successfully as a scholar and a public intellectual um, and you know, where you're really doing it, you're really making arguments and, um, and, and this kind of writing, because I think this is just a shift from your, in your voice, right? We we're getting a whole different dimension of you. And if you could just talk about that, that tension and kind of where you were going to take it from here too. It's a really important part of the learning process for me was shifting from expository voice where I'm making arguments very explicitly, particularly in my op-ed writing and my prescriptive mode of writing, prescriptive mode meaning. So started out like most academics in explanatory mode. Why did event happen? Why did event ha X happen the way it did? Here's some possible reasons. Here's my explanation. Later on as a scholar, more recently, I shifted into prescriptive mode. How should the world be? And that came out that comes out most explicitly in my op-eds and in op-eds what you really have to do is you have to you have to hit the reader over the head with your arguments because the whole point is to anticipate your critics and articulate the argument that your critic has or might make and the strongest version of it not the straw man version of it and then rebut it so it's it's like classic debating style and it's very explicitly um expository and argumentative um a a memoir can't do that at all. And that helps explain the swearing that my mentor did initially because he, he really explained it to me this way. You have to trust your reader and you can't trust your reader when you're writing op-eds because you have to always be anticipating your critics and you're trying to persuade people of taking action on a certain political act that they may not have wanted to do. So you don't trust anyone, right? It's like in making a case in a, in a law court. You don't just say, well, I trust the jury that they'll just feel me and they'll relate to me, right? In a memoir, I'm not trying to persuade anyone to take action. I'm trying to get them to examine their own political and social life and model that vulnerability for them. Now, in the end, I hope there are lessons they will learn, but they have to be done much more subtly. And I'll just give you a, a literal example of something that had to go. When I was talking about sort of racist, racist songs that we sang at Hebrew summer camp in the 80s, I had a line in there, we never asked, we never thought about those racist songs. No, we didn't. I'm kind of parodying myself or something, but it was so over the top. You can take all that out in the memoir, let the story tell itself. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. one thing you really you really have to do, and that, of course, also in in filmmaking. Um, and your oh yeah, so I really had to learn a new genre, and I've really appreciated learning the genre and shifting it. And I'll go back and forth to other types of writing too. So I just published an op-ed with my co-author uh, uh, co Bernie Farber. We write a lot together on the plight of Hassan Diab, and that's a case going on right now in Canada about potential extradition to France. And that's very expository and we're you know, making our case in a very obvious way. That said, um, one thing I will continue to do in my op-ed writing that is inspired by my memoir, but didn't just begin with my memoir is sometimes bring my own vulnerability and my own subjectivity to bear. So in other words, I will import some of the creative nonfiction elements back into my expository writing. And I encourage my students to do that. And an example of when I did that was after the Pittsburgh a massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And I wrote a piece for the Globe and Mail. And there I wrote not only as a scholar who was analyzing the dynamics of anti-Semitism in the US and by extension Canada, but as a Jew. And I was very clear that I was writing it as a Jew and, and I made my emotional um, uh, context very obvious in that piece. And it sort of toggled between um, expository and subjective. And, and what, one can do that. Once, once one has learned all the styles, then you can sort of start to make your own pastiche, as we know. It's interesting, though, because you could be more persuasive in, at writing a memoir, more politically persuasive writing a memoir than you might be writing an op-ed. I mean, for instance, like your, like your character, Mira, is modeling that an, that a love of modern Hebrew does not have to be a colonial endeavor or a nationalistic endeavor. It could be just love of language. Now that's, and that's complicated, but I feel that way, but that's, that's actually very, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to tease out in this current climate. And um, you do it not by saying, well, you know, languages are languages and they're neutral because they're not neutral. There's tons of 
implicit biases in modern Hebrew about, about conquering Palestine, but you're showing the love through memory, through nostalgia, through culture. And that um, that's an emotional connection that you feel as an audience member when you're not being told it in, in essay form or in op-ed form. And I find that really fascinating that you could, <laughs> that, it could that it could be more powerful that way. You know? And that, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about it because my dad had written a question on Hebrew. How can we separate the love of Hebrew from its nationalistic con connotations? And that is something, Brian, you and I talk a lot about. And we also talk a lot about cultural honoring in possible new scenarios of Israel-Palestine, new political possibilities where culture would be, dual cultures would be elevated rather than erased. And Arabic would be elevated alongside Hebrew, which would be elevated. And I mean, you worked on an Israeli right. film, um, which I love and I want to plug for everyone. It is a wonderful, you know what? Richard Gere gets the Mensch of the Year Award for this film. He went nerd, nebbish, opposite. This is a film called Norman, by the way. Film called the, film Norman. Is called, the film is called Norman. Yeah. The film is called Norman, and he went opposite the Israeli, my favorite Israeli heartthrob. Like, is that, that took a lot of guts, right? To, to not be the heartthrob, to take on a role where he's the nerd. Oh, to be the nebbish? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, he wants, he, wants, he wants great parts. So not so much. It's not that brave. Okay, he's very good at it, but very good at it. He's, he's played plenty of heartthrobs. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, he, those are the, who needs more of that? So that's yeah, a wonderful character thing actor. that Brian edited, and it also has an allergy scene that I had to I had to message Brian. Oh, yeah, like, the movie's on pause. I don't know if I can watch the rest of the scene. Can you let me know, like trigger warning, and you let me know what I could or couldn't watch? So no spoilers. Remember that was oh god that was oh my, okay. So Hebrew, yes, I don't view, I view Hebrew as an important cultural touchstone and that there is a possibility of elevated cultures and new reimagined Israel-Palestine. Um, Christine wants to know how my own children were involved in the writing process. Yeah, I definitely cleared um, this one or two scenes where my daughter is involved. I cleared it with her and it was very important for me that nothing about my children would be in any way humiliating or mocking. And she was reassured, and, and I wouldn't do that really anyway to other characters, because I don't think that that really does much artistic or political work. So really I'm the one being critiqued mostly in the book, um, except for a few, a few other instances. And in, in this case, she didn't mind because I was the, um, I, I end up being quite self-critical in that scene, it, which takes place at Jewish summer camp, at her Jewish summer camp. So it was important for me to put it in. There were some other things I could have put in that were interesting moments where I um, met some of her other Jewish youth group colleagues and perhaps overstepped with my political utterances and that didn't go over so well. Um, but I, I, I was able to leave those out and just use some other things. And, I, but, and they've read little bits of it. Um, they've started coming to my book talks and I have a spinoff piece in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, about what happened after chapter two, when I learn I have a, a brother who's been given up for adoption, I'm seven, and he had been given up uh, eight years earlier, what happened um, 20 years later when I met him. And that's a spinoff piece in Haaretz. So my daughter's read that, my son promises he'll read it. And, but she can feel, you know, they can feel the emotional tension in the book, even if it's not a chapter that's particularly traumatic. And I, I don't know if they necessarily want to go there yet, but they'll, they'll find it in their own way. Um, and actually the person who warned me the most, oh, am I allowed to name drop? Yes. And Brian and Laura will like this. There is one person I talked to who was um, right when the memoir was going to be submitted um, before it was going to press. And she said, be very careful about your children, like really protect them. And that was Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And I trust her with um, those kinds of instincts about love and protection. So I, I was quite careful. Um, expository forms cannot be separated from our subjectivity. There can be a view where we always speak from things like, yeah, of course, we subjectivity and objectivity are always melded and merged. And I encourage my students to draw on that. I guess I just want, I want people to be aware of their subjectivity. And that's also why I don't use the word bias. You'll really never hear me use the word bias ever because I find it, it sets up um, a dichotomy between our own subjective experience and the way we experience the world. And I, so for that reason, yeah, good. Were there, um, go, okay, Laura, I've been talking so a lot. 
Um, no, I think this is great. And um, I'm so glad that people are, um, are, are in the chat and that we're able to kind of move back and forth because we wanted this to be more of a conversation. So I'm, I, I think um, uh, I want to go back to Brian because Brian, we talked about, you know, this question about the past and the past and the present. And you talked a little bit about nostalgia and I, and I wanted you to come back to that and, um, sure. and talk about some of that. And um, yeah. Let's, let's go there. Well, it, it was generated by, I was listening to a podcast about Annie Hall, Woody Allen's in the news a lot, again, and Mia Farrow lately because of the HBO movie. Um, and it was about Annie Hall. It was, I mean, that's beside the point, but it was about the idea of, of, of you know, the, the past is living, a representation of the past is not, is not neutral. It's, a, it's, sub, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impression based on where you are in the present. And um, I, I, what they were saying was that um, by, by at least in Annie Hall, the way that nostalgia functions is that is that it makes that relationship in the, in that film um, meaningful in the present to him, thinking back on it, even though in the moment the actual moments were not charged with the same kind of um, um, sensitivity and explosiveness that they are in retrospect and. Packaging it as nostalgia makes 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 that character. I mean, for better or worse, say that was an important part of my life, and I'm honoring it by by thinking of it nostalgically. And I thought about that a lot reading your book, Mira, because I feel like um, you're valid you're validating in a way that summer camp experience by thinking of it nostalgically. You're saying that. Hebrew means something to you now in the present. Lots of people go to Hebrew, or maybe not immersion camp, but a lot of people go to Jewish summer camp or go to Hebrew school and don't have nostalgia. They have uh, trauma <laughs> or, or hatred of, of, of those experiences, but you have nostalgia. And I wonder how does that, what, what is it about Mira in the present that needs to see those experiences with nostalgia? It, to me, it, it's, it's validating and it's saying that, that Hebrew is part of my life now. Mm -hmm. It's as much as it was then, because um, you're you're charting a, a a path where it where it's meaningful and actually generative for your future as well. Um, so I just think that nostalgia gets a really bad rap, and I think it's unfairly maligned often, and it gets mm -hmm. a bad rap because it's often considered with politically retrograde or reactionary policies and outlooks, xenophobic outlooks, and I have really been really deeply interested in nostalgia so interested that on the call when Laura was mentoring me by the way this thing about mentoring most of Laura's mentees are young scholars just starting out I'm no longer a young scholar but I said to Laura can I get in there too and when I say mentor like this completely an informal friend relationship of mentoring there's nothing formal here um, there was nothing formal. can I get in there too I see all these young scholars just bursting with possibility and potential I want to still burst with possibility and potential and one of the things I told Laura on that phone call was that I had had a book manuscript under contract with the university press on the topic of nostalgia and political change and it never got published and it was mm. sort of the low point and I really think it's really important for academics to talk about and failure isn't the right word because it was a low point it wasn't necessarily a failure failure implies binary they gave me the opportunity to revise it but it would have involved heavy revisions i didn't feel i had it in me and i lost my confidence so it was it was a low point but not necessarily failure it just it didn't get published i did get an article out of it which is in a journal um on nostalgia and canadian um, immigration policy and so the kernel of the idea was there and what i was really trying to do in that book was harness the idea of what i called ironic nostalgia it's a little bit following Svetlana Bloom's, um, uh, what does she call it? Reflex, uh, reflective nostalgia, yeah. And oh, yeah. I was, yeah. yeah, and I was trying to say that if nostalgia is done carefully, it can help us engage with our collective past. And I was looking at collective groups of like Jewish communities or Canadian settler communities in a, done carefully, it can help us say goodbye to what we perceived was a simpler past, quote unquote, of course, that's no such thing objectively, but that's how we yeah. experience the past and then open ourselves to a, to a new future, open ourselves to, to political change. So it was really grounded in political psychology and collective psychology and social dynamics. And I'm, I'm, for me, nostalgia, nostalgia can be painful. Well, obviously that's what me. It's a bittersweet longing for the past. And it can be hard for me 
personally to live in such a nostalgic frame, but I do try to say, what can I do with that? What can I do with that love for Jewish summer camp in Hebrew? What can I do with that love of singing the song about longing for the Sinai? We were 10 years old singing a song written when Israel had won the Sinai Peninsula. It's called a Shalom Shech. And it's longing for that, but that, I mean, it didn't really make sense. I mean, by that time, Israel had signed a peace agreement with Egypt. It was about to give the Sinai back to Egypt. And there we are singing almost this hyper-nationalist, territorially expansionist, expansionist song about Sharma Shek. But it was so beautiful and the harmonies were so good. I, you know, I write about this in the book and there was a dirty version in Hebrew, of course. <laughs> And so what can I do with this? Well, what, what I can do is go travel to Sharm el which I have, and learn Arabic, which I do, and think about new possibilities. And fortunately, the Israel-Egypt piece is holding, but so now I can think about new possibilities with Israelis and Palestinians. I, I think that that's really helpful and, um, and, and hard because, again, the the, the ideas around nostalgia, I keep, I keep thinking about the, I, I love that Boehm talks about the future of nostalgia um, and it's not so universal. I have a student who's working on Iraqi Jewish memory and the ways in which nostalgia doesn't work because you know, it's not about diasporic existence. They were there for all, you know, for centuries on end, right? And so, um, and the break was, you know, when they had to leave in the fifties to go to Israel and then her grandmother lived in a tent um, and so it was this loss of not, you know, it wasn't longing for home, they were at home. Um, so we, we've been, I, I've spent a lot of time with the student thinking about that question um, um, this last couple of months um, as she's thinking about going to graduate school, actually just gone into graduate program. And, um, and this has been a real, a real question, but I think in my, in my own work, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I pick up on something else in Baum, this book called The Future of Nostalgia. And so she, she talks about diasporic intimacy and she talks about what happens when um, you've lost everything. And um, I mean, really traumatic loss. So that can be, you know, um, uh, uh, exile, which was a part of her story. She was um, um, a Russian Jew. And, um, and, but it can also be trauma and violence. And, um, and when you've lost everything, there's this possibility that you can make a connection to someone else who's also lost something. And that there can be moments of tenderness that, and that's the surprise, the surprise of tenderness when you've lost everything. And I, I feel like that's, that's a piece of, it's not as overt in your, narrative, but I do think that that is some of the ways in which you connect um, yeah. to the Palestinian question, at, you know, at its most poignant. Um, and it does mean losing, You've it has to do with losing, you know, the, the, that song and its pleasures, right? It has to do with both understanding how much you love that and then you don't have it anymore. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a part of the, mm -hmm. the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So there's layers of loss. And in terms of reaching out to Palestinians and the feeling of um, shared loss, shared connection, shared trauma, it also has to be done properly. And there's a scene in the book where I think it isn't necessarily done properly on my part, but I, I don't necessarily reflect on that as much in the book, but it came out last night in my conversation with my dad where I'm with my friend Oded Levenheim, who's a wonderful uh, scholar, prof of international relations at Hebrew University. He's Israeli, Israeli Jew, and he wrote a wonderful book about his daily mountain bike commute to um, Hebrew U campus from his home in Mevaseret, Sion, a suburb of Jerusalem, and what he finds along the way every day, what he finds inside himself, what he finds about the history etched into the place. And he took me on the route and we did it together and we talked about it. And while we were at one of the sites that he, pro that he um, chronicles Lifta is a Palestinian village that is now part of Jerusalem, we bumped into, we encountered, let's use kind of big words, we encountered two young Palestinians, maybe they were in their early 20s, and we started engaging in conversation with them in Hebrew, which was our common language that we had with them. What are you doing? What are you up to? Um, hi, you know, how are you? And they said, we're visiting our town. Um, we're from here. Of course, we did some mental calculations. I think it would have been his grandmother or great grandmother that would have been from there. I tried to figure out the age group. 
Um, how does it feel to be back? We said, well, they said, what's, what's done is done. The past is the past. We didn't buy it, right? We didn't think they really necessarily believe that, but that's fine. And then I started thinking even last night when my dad was asking me about it, I started thinking, you know, that wasn't necessarily totally cool. Like they don't owe us a big political expositions. Like we didn't, we hadn't established any trust with them. And it wasn't something that I was necessarily aware of because at the time it took me many years. This was 10, about 10 years ago because I was hungry for knowledge. Mm -hmm. I was curious and I'm, I'm a nice open person, but these are things we have to sort of think through a little more carefully if we're going to do the work. It's sort of the mirror image of the scene where you talk to the swimming instructor mm. at the camp, mm -hmm. where it's a scene where you, um, it's your daughter, your daughter's swimming instructor, and he's Israeli. Sailing, please, please. Sailing. sailing. <laughs> of course. Um, and you want to, he's Israeli, so you want to speak to him in Hebrew and engage him in culture or politics. And he's, you know, he's a teenager. He doesn't, he's, he's you're the parent, like he, he's not super in, engaged. And I'm wondering like what, like, I mean, I so relate to the obsequiousness of, of North American Jews and talking to Israelis as if they have the upper hand and you're, you're the less powerful player because we're in the diaspora. And it's so embarrassing. And I, I, I mean, it, it made me cringe when I read that, but I related to it and I thought, why do we need to prove that we're stakeholders in, mm -hmm. In, know, in having knowledge about Israel, in, in, in understanding this conflict or the culture, it's, um, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that you don't, um, I don't know if you address that specifically, but you, you engage with the issues by illustrating scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, some I do. Difficult thing, yeah. I'm mentioning that a little bit, but, but the one difference between what I do mention that sort of a mea culpa and he doesn't really care and why should he care and why should he care that I'm a columnist in Haaretz and why should he care that I just got back from a Breaking the Silence tour and I, I do, I am- Or even know what it is. Yeah, exactly. I am a yeah. bit obviously self-deprecatory in that scene as I'm relaying it to the, um, to the reader, but one difference is you said we feel, I don't disagree with disagree with you, but I, I do have a little bit of a different positionality. You said we have to prove that we're stakeholders. I feel I am a stakeholder, but maybe I'm not, right? And maybe that's really the question. We don't live there. I mean, this is, I mean, we're really, we're really not, I mean, well, we can argue about it, but. Yeah, well, that's the question. <laughs> why do we need, why do we want to, why are we first brainwashed to feel that we should be or are, and then how do we engage with that education and deal with it as adults? It's hard. Um, that will be the subject of my next book. Yeah. Um, how to talk about Zionism and trying to really get at the emotional attachment that we do, many of us do feel, but then what does that mean for really thinking about governance structures over there? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, these are wow. important questions. Yeah. And I just want to come back around because this is kind of where we began. And I think that there is this other question, like, are the two of you who are somewhat younger than I am, um, quite a bit younger than I am, uh, are you kind of the last of a generation of, um, dare I call them liberal Jews, left-leaning Jews, who have had this love with a uh, love of Israel, right? Um, I think some one of the people in the chat, you know, pointed out that passage about your love affair, right? Um, your broken heart, the the whole the whole the whole sense of that love. Because um, I've often thought, well, you know, in order to crit in order to be critical, you have to have, you know, you have to own the love that you had, because I think some of the anger that some folks have is about the betrayal of that. And so then they get very, very um, yeah. self-righteous and arrogant in, 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 in expressing their anger, but the anger is really motivated by this sort of loss of the love. Um, but then, you know, I think about so many of my students now, um, younger generation of um, certainly American and maybe Canadians slightly different, but um, who have not grown up loving this place or for whom it has not been a central piece of their experience. And I think that this is another piece of the sort of audience, I think, for the book maybe that you're going to write next. But I think this book is a window into um, a moment which might be really quite foreign for, for many of the students we teach now who didn't grow up with that kind of self-evidency um, certainly, like I could say, at Temple University, where I teach, 
most of my students have, you know, many of them will go on birthright because they've never been out of the country and it's a free trip. And, you know, and certainly, you know, I, who am I to stop them from, I, I mean, I think it's, it's an important thing for them to go, but um, even if I'm critical of that, of that format of many of those trips, but, um, but they don't have the kind of camp experience. Um, they're not, they're not at Camp Ramah or even at like the nifty camps. Um, I just, you know, there are these Jewish youth movements um, in North America that 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 do have all these Israeli, you know, uh, folks who are on the camp staff, et cetera. And it becomes a part of that experience. And this is just different. So I think I'm gonna ask you to answer that question and we'll kind of have to wrap it up. I'm just noticing we have three minutes. Yes, well, I think the, the big question is, so exactly a year after, me no when so birthright used to be only open to age 26 for a long time they've extended it a bit so let's say ages 18 to 26 for most of the time I was 27 when birthright was created and I was living in Israel my husband was stringing doing some freelance journalism work and he even wrote a piece about the first birthright trip remember so that was a, a mo important moment um, so after my generation is the birthright generation. And that is, yes, these quick hit trips, a free 10 day trip to Israel, free 10 day trip to Israel with the hope of the aim of creating love for Israel, creating Jewish philanthropists and creating Jews, marrying Jews and having Jewish babies, right? That's the, there's a, there's a lot of scholarly literature on this and the goals of it and identity creation and identity maintenance. So I guess the question is what will the birthright generation look like when they're when they're or what are they looking like and i think this is what we need to to look at yeah and also the ones who who aren't going to go who have decided for political for their own political reasons that they're not going to go and they define themselves as jewish because they um you know they 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 go and they do tshuva in the front of an ice um detention place you know mm -hmm. Shabbat services there this is the kind of thing that i'm seeing now many of my students are engaged in and they're really not engaged in israel in israel they're really you know finding other ways of imagining mm -hmm. so I, I i really i'm 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 cognizant of the time and i wanted to just ask mira if you would just maybe um let us uh, give us a few words to conclude. And thank you all so much for this very rich conversation. There are just, I, I can't, I won't really conclude with a statement. I'll just conclude with reminding us of a few of the unanswered questions that's just sort of emerged. And one of them was whether and to what degree Canadian Jews feel themselves as stakeholders and whether they morally or ethically are and if there would even be a way to adjudicate that question. Mm -hmm. And um, and then, well, diaspora Palestinians form a little bit of a different um, community because I'm talking about Jews who are not Israelis versus Palestinians who did come from Palestine, although Jews who aren't Israelis may have hailed from ancient Israel many, many, many years ago. So there, there's some complexities there. The other question is whether um, by the end of a memoir, by the end of the craft of writing a memoir, one lands at some more emotional and political certainty, and whether after one reads a memoir and does the implicit work of examining oneself, whether that helps someone come to more certainty, and even if there is such a thing as as, as having that sort of political certainty, and whether that's even a desirable thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll end with questions, because what profs love more than answers is questions, because we want to <laughs> Think of questions and send other people off to do the work and answer them. And I really appreciate everyone's questions. And I so appreciate Laura and Brian's um, discussion and insights and observations. And we have so much more to talk about. And one thing that Brian and I um, need to do when the pandemic ends is the one of the last things on my calendar before the pandemic or at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the last things on my calendar that was canceled was tickets for Brian and his husband, Jonathan, a fellow Canadian and me to go see my favorite musical as a child because the Jewish high school put it on when I was 10. And from then on, I was absolutely smitten. We had tickets right down the street from um, Jonathan and Brian's home in New York to see. So we're gonna see West Side Story next time, aren't we? And company and, and Carolina Change. Yes, good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really happy Purim to those and, who celebrate. Yes, happy Purim. Yes, have a drink. Holiday tonight. And thank you, Stephanie and Mary, for hosting in the Faculty of Public Affairs and my colleagues at Carleton.
Thank you so much, Mira. Thanks, Laura, Brian. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.